Hello everyone, my name is Pixel Riffs and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you're all having a good day. In today's episode, we're actually going to take a step back from a villager trading and look at the darker side. We're going to go to the nether and we're going to look at piglin bartering because I think that's kind of the next step in being able to acquire some more resources for ourselves here. And of course, we will put those resources to good use in different projects around the world. So far, I've managed to collect a decent amount of librarians here and I'll cover those in a second but one of the things I want to focus on today with piglin bartering is being able to acquire objects like quartz. Since we can get blocks of it from the stonemasons now, and these four stonemasons have all been traded up so that they are master level and will now trade me blocks of quartz and quartz pillars. I'm working on the four on the other side. But as I mentioned in the previous episode, we still want ways of getting hold of the item of quartz, and we can get that by fortuning quartz or blocks in the nether, but the piglins will allow us to get it renewably. So Alongside all of the other benefits of piglin bartering, I think it's going to be worth getting a renewable supply of quartz that way. Over here we have a bunch of farmers, most of whom have now been upgraded to the point where they can trade me melons, and many of them have pumpkins available for trade as well. We haven't zombified and cured any of these yet because of the difficulty settings in this world being set to normal, so I don't want to risk losing any of these villagers instead of them converting, but... Some of these have started giving me discounts on the melon and pumpkin trades now that I've been trading with them a little bit more, so we can actually get a great deal more emeralds out of a stack or two of pumpkins that way, and eventually we will end up converting them all into zombies and curing them so we get one-to-one -one trades for pumpkins and melons to emeralds. But in the meantime, I haven't had to worry too much about that, what with how productive my melon and pumpkin farm has been for the last little while, and so we can trade a bunch of stuff to the farmers and gain the emeralds that we need to trade stuff elsewhere, which is how come I've been able to level up these stonemasons so quickly. It's because all we need is a bunch of emeralds that we can trade for blocks, and we can acquire blocks like dripstone and the glazed terracotta colors that way. Masons will give you either some regular terracotta or some glazed terracotta once they get to expert level, so those are really nice trades to have if you want some of those and you don't feel like spending the dyes on dyeing natural terracotta. Over on this side, I've actually labeled each of my librarians' initial trades, and I was going for their first trade being a book that I wanted, so that once we locked them into the profession, it didn't really matter what other trades came up later, but we may still get some useful books further down the line. Remember that librarians can have up to four book trades once you upgrade them to full master professions. So I think that's a good sign for this setup that we have a bunch of really useful books to begin with. I figure infinity is going to be worth doing since I have that on a bow and I'll need to renew the infinity effect on future bows once they become too expensive to repair. Fortune 3 is always a useful one to have around, as is Silk Touch, but my mending villager also trades Silk Touch, and once we move him over from the igloo, we'll be able to get both of those trades here. Feather Falling 4 is one of those ones that can sometimes show up on boots, but sometimes you need to add it to boots later. The same with Depth Strider, so these two trades were going to be pretty essential. Efficiency 5 is a pretty obvious one. I would settle for Efficiency 4, since you can get Efficiency 4 from the enchanting table a lot of the time, but having a straight Efficiency 5 book and a relatively inexpensive one at that is kind of worth skipping ahead to and just upgrading stuff all the way. The only things I wouldn't want Efficiency 5 on are probably a shovel, because you don't need it to break any specific blocks. And that's probably it, actually. You don't need an Efficiency 5 hoe all of the time, but that does allow you to break nether wart and warped warp blocks instantly, so Efficiency 5 is useful on basically any tool you can apply it to. Maybe shears. I don't think we'd need it on shears. Looting 3 is obviously a really important one as well. I had Looting 2 on this sword for absolutely ages, so having a looting trade was going to make a lot of sense, and if I need to apply that to any other sword, in future than I can. I had the hardest time getting an Unbreaking book to show up, and eventually I settled for Unbreaking 1, simply because this book costs less than 10 emeralds. And if you think about it, we can combine two Unbreaking 1 books to get an Unbreaking 2 book, and you can combine two Unbreaking 2 books to get an Unbreaking 3 book. That would only cost me 36 emeralds and 4 books, whereas the Unbreaking 3 book would probably cost about that much anyway, so the only thing we're really sacrificing is a couple of extra books, and these villagers will often trade you bookshelves that you can break down into three books apiece anyway. And finally, Finally, Protection 3. Once again, because you can combine these two to get a full Protection 4, but I often find that Protection 3 comes up on enchanted gear when I enchant it in an enchanting table anyway, so upgrading it to Protection 4 that way is going to make a lot more sense. Once you've set up a villager trading area like this, you might also want to keep some chests around to keep basic supplies, emeralds, and the goods that you typically trade with them in here. This is just a junk chest while I was trying to clear my inventory for grabbing more crops so I could upgrade the farmers, but we will end up 
moving some stuff around in here and keeping some storage chests handy that will have emeralds and books and various things that we traded with these villagers later. And the other reason to get hold of a lot of librarian villagers is that further down their trades they will often trade you glass which can be a really useful thing to just buy from villagers especially considering that sand is not renewable and takes a while to acquire a lot of it. So that's the status update on the trading hall so far. It's been really nice to get hold of lots of dripstone blocks and have the prospect of getting quartz blocks from the stonemasons but now we're going to turn our attention to the nether. And one thing I did on streams a while ago but I haven't acknowledged yet in the main series is that I moved the nether portal. I've actually set up the nether portal there in my storage system and it linked to a different place in the nether. We're actually up here directly opposite the portals that go to the iron farm and to the mob farm at spawn. So one of the things I am planning on doing is converting this area into the beginnings of my nether hub. And a while back I had an idea for a nether hub that was going to be based sort of on the copied city from Nier Automata. That kind of style where everything was white and it focused on the shape and the architecture of everything rather than it being something with a bunch of different textures and bringing a ton of real world blocks in. I wanted the quartz so that we could do that but having done a couple of tests of that the problem with building something like that in the nether is the difficulty with lighting. The nether is quite a dark place there is no natural daylight and as such you do need to light up the area pretty meticulously in order for any of the lighting to feel even and with a block as clean as quartz the lighting just didn't look right and there aren't very many pure white light sources that we could hide in places that would make it look any good. So I might return to that project idea another time in the overworld but instead what I've decided I might do is create a sort of dark world version of my storage room. So the area that we had there in the overworld I would like to reproduce sections of that in the nether and it can be kind of creepy and twisted and use some nether blocks in there to make it really obviously a different version of what is beyond in the overworld but I think instead of the villager trading hall portion of that storage room I would like to start a piglin bartering setup there. Of course one of the things I will need to do before I start any piglin bartering is switch to my gold helmet so we don't end up with any unwanted surprises with the piglins attacking us and of course we will need to get hold of a decent amount of gold ingots because while piglins can be distracted by and will pick up any golden items you'll see that they pick it up they admire it for a second and then they will just tuck it away in their inventory the only thing that they will barter for is full ingots of gold so we need to acquire a decent source of those let's see how much gold i already have here in the overworld in my storage system there's seven blocks worth of it in here and a decent amount of golden ingots in here so enough to get us started with the process of piglin bartering and probably take a look at everything it's possible to get through piglin bartering but we might need a place to get hold of some gold long term got plenty of deep slate gold and gold ore in here but i'm actually thinking of saving those for future projects as ore blocks and of course when you break down that gold ore when you end up mining it with fortune you can get hold of a bunch of these raw gold items which can be turned into a unique raw gold block and that's something I might want to preserve as well. So long term, the plan is to acquire gold ingots directly. And the best way to do that is by farming zombie piglins. But that is going to be a longer and more technical project than I really have time for right now. So what we're going to do is take some of the gold that we have already acquired, some of the blocks of gold that I might have fished up from nether portals and ocean monuments, since there are eight blocks of gold at the core of one of those ocean monuments. I'm going to take some of the gold ingots here as well, and we could even fashion some gold nuggets into gold ingots if we wanted to but we're going to return to the nether with those and we're going to trap a piglin and have them trade basically everything they can to us and through that we'll be able to take a more comprehensive look at the benefits of piglin bartering and why we're going to be setting up a permanent solution for it in the foreseeable future so back here in the nether we're going to track down a piglin again and unfortunately piglins will despawn in the same way that other mobs will so Every so often you will find that the piglins that you left in the nether are no longer there. In future we'll probably end up name tagging some of these piglins to prevent them from despawning if we want to have a permanent trading setup in the same way that we have one in the overworld. But for now, I'm going to be throwing a few... Oh, where the heck were all of they? Hello? Yeah, I threw the gold ingot on the ground and it's almost as though the sound is coming from the ingot. Anyway, in order to make sure that we can examine the trades that we get from piglin bartering, we're going to have the piglin sat on top of a hopper. We're going to have the hopper output into a double chest here. And that's part of the reason we're going to lock this piglin up. Because if I open this chest now, regardless of what I'm wearing, gold armor aside, the piglins are just going to get really angry at me for opening and messing with a chest because they think it's theirs. So I'm going to try and lure a piglin over with these gold ingots. We're going to try and get him to drop into this hole right here which should be simple enough to do all we got to do is have him jump up onto that block and then give him a nudge in the right direction 
There we go, you're in the hole now. And then once he's in this hole, we can throw a gold ingot on the blocks nearby, and he should be able to pick it up through those blocks, like so. When he picks up the gold ingot, he's going to appraise it for a second, attempt to throw an item back to us, but he's simply going to drop that at his feet if he can't throw it to the player, and that means it's going to end up in the hopper, where we can take a look inside the chest. So if I throw a bunch of golden ingots on the ground in between these two blocks right here, just on the corner, he's going to continuously pick up gold ingots from that stack, and he's going to deposit everything that he trades back to us in this chest. Unfortunately, having all of the blocks of netherrack around him like this breaks the line of sight, which means he doesn't mind if I open up this chest, I just have to be a little wary of any other piglins who sneak up on us during this process. I'm only going to feed him a few gold ingots at a time because we don't want those despawning on us, but I've broken down the gold blocks into gold ingots as well, so now we have more than a stack of ingots that we can trade with him. And already the stuff we're getting from piglin bartering is beginning to add up in here. I'm going to put the spectral arrows in there as well, since that's the first thing that the piglin threw at me, and I'm just going to have the piglin chew through the rest of this gold, grab the occasional items that he spits out onto the surface here, and we're going to examine the results of all of this piglin bartering once we're done. Okay, a short time later, we have done all of the bartering that we can with the gold that I brought, and we now have a pretty representative sample of the items you can acquire from piglin bartering, and I've separated them out here into categories which we can discuss. A lot of this has been calculated thanks to the folks who work on the Minecraft wiki who have a table of the items that can be bartered and the percentages, chances of those showing up. So I'm going to explain some of that as we go here as well pausing occasionally just to make sure that ghasts don't fireball me while I'm trying to do a tutorial. So the first two rows of items are a category all of their own. I've just kind of separated them into placeable blocks and then items, but all of these are what I consider the common items. These all have about an 8% chance of showing up, and while obviously that seems low for a common item, there are obviously a lot of them, and so that 8% applies to any of these items showing up, and that's a pretty broad category. This includes fairly valuable seeming blocks like Obsidian and Crying Obsidian, and this is the only way to get hold of Crying Obsidian renewably, whereas regular Obsidian can be obtained by mining out the towers in the end dimension and then respawning the dragon to replenish the supply of Obsidian. The main difference here, though, is that we don't have to mine it at all if piglins trade it to us. While we don't get a huge amount of it, you only get one block of obsidian as opposed to one to three blocks of crying obsidian every time they barter it, it does save you the hassle of having to spend a bunch of time mining obsidian. So that might be a valuable place to get it, although you're also only getting an 8% chance of obsidian showing up alongside all of these other blocks. Blackstone being renewable here is a great one, as is gravel being renewable, because gravel is useful for a bunch of different stuff, including manufacturing concrete powder along with sand and some dye. This is the only renewable source of gravel. Without piglin bartering, gravel would not be a renewable resource. Gravel also allows us to make coarse dirt, which can be fashioned back into regular dirt, and that makes dirt renewable as well, which is kind of an interesting concept. Even though dirt is abundant in the world in default terrain, for challenge maps like Skyblock, having gravel as a piglin bartering resource is really essential. We also have soul sand here, which is obviously abundant in soul sand valleys, you can acquire tons of it there. But once again, this is our opportunity to have this be a renewable resource, which is not something that comes along all too often. Now some of the other things in here that we're typically going to ignore are things like leather, which you can get abundantly from cows, so that's not as big of a deal. Fire charges, while they are effective and can be fired using dispensers, I don't find a great deal of survival use uses for them when a flint and steel is good enough to set a fire in most circumstances. Speaking of setting a fire, I'm getting attacked by ghasts, so let me deal with that. And a couple of shots from over here should be enough to take care of him. <laughs> let me get rid of all of this fire, and then we'll continue with our exploration of piglin bartering. So, spectral arrows are an interesting one. While they are really nice to have as a piglin bartering exchange, spectral arrows, much like the other potion-tipped arrows, cannot be used in conjunction with infinity. They are a limited supply, they will run out even if your bow has infinity. So, I don't tend to use them all that much. They can be crafted using glowstone dust and regular arrows. You put four glowstone dust and an arrow into a crafting table, you will end up getting spectral arrows that way, but I find they're not all that useful because the main purpose of spectral arrows is to highlight the enemy that you're attacking with a glowing effect. But there are so few enemies in the game that are going to survive a direct hit from an arrow from a power 5 bow anyway, it's unlikely that you will really need to use spectral arrows all that much. Boss mobs like the Wither and the Ender Dragon, which have more health, are also immune to potion effects, which includes the glowing effect. So 
I don't typically find spectral arrows all that useful. They're nice to have, I suppose, but I don't really find them of great utility in a survival context. Nether Brick is a good one to get from Piglin Bartering though, because you can smelt it from Netherrack, and of course you're going to have tons and tons of Netherrack throughout your world, but being able to craft nether brick blocks whenever you want to, and also craft the variant of red nether brick, which you get from combining nether brick and nether wart, that's actually really nice. It's going to be good to have a decent supply of nether brick from these piglins to prevent us from having to chew through all of our supplies of netherrack, where it could be useful in a lot of other ways. Now, the next tier of items, the ones I'm calling uncommon here, which only have a 4.3% chance of showing up, is just a very small category of nether quartz and string. And I think both of these are really useful, but string can be acquired in so many other ways, whereas nether quartz can only be acquired from mining it. And of course, as we've been mentioning with the villager trading project, you can get full blocks of quartz or quartz pillars from that, but you cannot get the quartz items which are necessary for crafting at least three redstone components and could be usable for all sorts of other things in future. Nether quartz can also be combined with cobblestone to make diorite. And then from there, you can combine the diorite with cobblestone to make andesite or combine it with another piece of quartz in order to get granite. So if you ever want to produce large quantities of decorative stone without going mining for it, that's something else you can do with a large tradable supply of nether quartz. And once again, with gold being so easily renewable, it's a good way of getting hold of renewable supplies of all kinds of stuff like nether quartz. Then we move on to the rare items, which have a 2.1% chance of appearing, but obviously they appear in larger quantities. Like, for example, iron nuggets. You can get a decent amount of these from a single gold ingot if you are lucky. Typically, piglins are going to trade you between 10 and 36 iron nuggets, and imagine we traded two gold ingots here. We got 26 per trade, so that's not too bad. This might have been the result of three gold ingot trades, but either way, we get a decent amount of iron nuggets, and that is important for one slightly more specific reason, and that's that the nether itself can actually be used to play survival. Like, if you started in the nether, everything you need for the survival progression can technically be found in this dimension. You can get wood from crimson and warped trees, you can break that down into sticks to make your first wooden tools, mine some blackstone or some gold ore and trade it with piglins to get blackstone, and you'd be able to create some stone tools. You might occasionally find iron ingots in chests in nether fortresses, but a way of getting iron renewably in the nether when there is no iron ore present and no villagers to create iron golems or whatever else is by trading piglins to get iron nuggets, which can be turned into iron ingots, and from there you could step up to iron tools and armor. And obviously from there you can go out into nether fortresses and bastions to find diamonds, and then you could upgrade from there to netherite with ancient debris and gold. So there's actually a surprising amount of survival that can be played exclusively in the nether dimension, and maybe we'll do that in the future of this series as a challenge. For the moment though, we'll turn our attention back to the other two things in this rare category, which are ender pearls and bottles of water. The water bottles are obviously tied into the potion brewing idea. You can't get water very easily in the nether, so it's obvious that these are precious to piglins, but I don't really see why we would need water bottles from these piglins outside of being able to travel back to the overworld and do stuff there. I guess maybe once you had blaze rods and blackstone, you could set up a brewing stand and everything you need to brew potions of fire resistance yourself is available to you here in the nether. So once again, those could contribute to nether survival, but that doesn't really matter all that much when in the epic category down here, they will actually have a chance of trading you fire resistance potions. And as you can see, we got three of those here and only one regular bottle of water. But we're skipping over ender pearls here. And ender pearls are an interesting one for folks who enjoy speedrunning, because one of the more common strategies to speedrun Minecraft, if you need to get ender pearls to fill up a stronghold portal frame to go to the end, is to acquire them here through piglin bartering instead of trying to track down individual endermen and then rolling the dice on whether those endermen are even going to drop ender pearls. It's a lot easier to get ender pearls with looting if you're fighting endermen directly, but otherwise, a decent amount of gold ingots. We've traded more than a stack here, but we got four ender pearls out of that. And often speedrunners will play on an earlier version of Minecraft, around 1.16.1, I believe, when the ender pearl trade from piglin bartering was a lot more common. It has been reduced in subsequent versions just to balance things out a little bit more. But since speedrunning is all about getting the fastest time, they're typically going to play on the version which will get them there the fastest. So having the ender pearl bartering option here is actually really useful for folks like that. And you can get them from cleric villages if you're playing a regular long survival game, but 
it's always really nice to know that you can get them from piglins here in the nether as well. So what we're thinking of as the epic category, I know we're kind of using like the loot box game style classifications here, but I kind of think it makes sense, right? We're getting potions of fire resistance from that, all of which would last a total of three minutes. But of course, if you can craft a brewing stand and throw some redstone dust in there, you can prolong the duration of these to eight minutes, which could be really useful in a pinch. Obviously, the piglins themselves are going to value potions of fire resistance because they are vulnerable to fire damage, unlike the zombie piglins, which are not. So it's kind of nice to have these as both a useful thing for the player and also a lore thing for the piglins. They've been able to brew up their own fire resistance potions for when they need to take some treacherous steps out into the nether. But either way, these are some of the least common items that you're going to get from piglin bartering. There is one other item that fits into this category, which I was not able to get from this piglin bartering session because the piglin decided to wear it, and that is the iron boots down there. Those iron boots are most likely enchanted with a random level of soul speed. But typically when a piglin finds a pair of boots resting on the ground, if they're not wearing boots already, they are going to put them on. Now piglins do favor gold items, so if we were to throw some golden boots on the ground, there's a chance that the piglin would trade those iron boots back to us in exchange for the gold ones. But another option is simply to kill the piglin in order to get hold of the boots because it will just be part of the piglin's equipment and they will drop that equipment when they die. Once we set up a permanent piglin bartering setup, we're going to find that the piglins are all wearing iron boots by the end of it unless they had gold boots already. But by that point, they'll probably have traded us a few additional pairs of iron boots and we won't need to worry about that. These only have soul speed one, but that's an enchantment I don't even have on my netherite boots yet. So that's something we need to look at in the near future. And that's also something which and that's also something which falls into our last category here of an item that we didn't even get from this piglin bartering setup it only has a 1.09 percent chance of appearing the odds are 5 in 459 according to the minecraft wiki so we could trade 459 gold ingots to a piglin we might only end up with five enchanted books and those are going to be enchanted with soul speed that is the main way of getting soul speed on a more permanent basis, although I believe we've already encountered some soul speed books in Piglin Bastions before. So while it's a bartering item if you want to get it renewably, it can also be a loot item that you'll be able to get with a little bit more reliability if you're raiding some Piglin Bastion structures. But that having a 1% chance of showing up, I decided to classify it as a legendary item in terms of Piglin bartering. So this is the spread of items we can expect to get. And as you can see, there's a ton of useful stuff here that we can't really get any other way, or it's simply a little bit easier for us to get it this way if it can be acquired passively in the background while we're doing other stuff. And that's the purpose of setting up a more permanent piglin bartering setup here in the nether. For the moment though, I'm going to crack open a shulker box, stuff a few items in here, and we're going to take all of these items back to the overworld because we'll probably end up using a great deal of them in the near future. And if you're wondering how I did the trick with the rarities and stuff appearing in the chests, it's probably obvious from the tooltips, but those are light gray stained glass panes that I put in there, renamed in an anvil. You might have noticed that my levels dropped between clips as well. So it's a really fun way of leaving markers in a chest like that that don't seem to be occupying an inventory slot. The default Minecraft GUI color makes this look kind of hidden, but obviously those are going to be difficult to spot if you come back later and forget that you left them there. So bear that in mind if you're using this trick yourself to mark out things in chests in your own worlds. Anyway, heading back through to the overworld, I'm going to distribute these items back into my storage system here so that we can stash all of this stuff away and not have it clog up my inventory too much. Then we're going to apply soul speed to these boots if the game lets me, if it's not too expensive for me to do in an anvil, and then we're going to explore what soul speed does as a kind of footnote to this episode, because while piglin bartering is something I want to set up in the near future, this was really just an introduction to it, and it's going to be much more effective when we have a better supply of gold. Well, funnily enough, it seems, on closer inspection, that I never got a Soul Speed book from any of the Bastions that I raided, which seems kind of absurd and unlikely, but it is simply the case. I looked through all of the enchanted books that I have, at least the ones that were stored in sensible places where I expected to find enchanted books, like the upstairs area of my starter house where the enchantment setup is, and I simply don't have a Soul Speed book anywhere there. Perhaps there might be one over at the skeleton farm, that's the only other place I can think of to look that I might have put enchanted books, but I don't think I've really been back to the skeleton farm since I would have acquired a soul speed book. So we're going to look there, and if we can't find one there, then I suppose the only option we have 
is to either continue trading with piglins, running out of gold as I do so, or head out to a piglin bastion in the hope that I can find a soul speed book in one of the chests I haven't already raided. But let's take a quick look down here just in case, because there are a couple of books in here, but no, these all seem like fairly standard ones that I would have just got out of the enchantment setup, right? Which makes a great deal of sense. Hello, skeleton spawn, I haven't been back to you for a while. Well, in that case, I think it's probably time to switch my golden helmet back in and go looking for a piglin bastion once again. Hopefully the golden helmet should at least give us a little bit of time alone with the chests that the piglins won't bother us and if we can aim for some bastions that we've already explored, then we shouldn't have to worry about running into piglin brutes either. So away beyond the nether fortresses is the big treasure cube bastion that we have raided in the past. I am hopeful that we'll be able to find a chest in here that still has a soul speed book. Now, question is, how do we get into this thing? I, I honestly don't remember. I guess I can come in through the side here and check out the chests on the upper level before we continue into the main treasure room part. And I thought I'd completely cleaned this out. Yes, I certainly seem to have here at least. And these two chests here, I left a couple of bits and pieces in, but there's just some arrows and there we go. Some Soul Speed 3 golden boots, but not a book that I can put on my netherite shoes. So I guess... We're going to have to keep looking further in. And there are occasionally going to be loot chests around the outside of here. I'm fairly certain I took out all the piglin brutes down here, but I'll be keeping my head on a swivel just in case. Oh, turns out there is one around the corner here, and it looks like there is a chest over there as well. So the brute is kind of guarding the chest in the corner, but hopefully I should be able to pillar up and avoid it attacking me. Here we go. We should be able to burn the brute in this little alcove. Not too worried about getting attacked by the regular piglins if we've dealt with the brute successfully. All I gotta do is stay out of that piglin's line of sight and... Oh, we got another snout armor trim, but it looks like we didn't get the soul speed enchantment here either. That's really unfortunate, actually. We've been to a couple of other bastions, though, right? I'm fairly certain that we have explored other bastions elsewhere in the world. There was definitely at least one by a far-flung nether portal. I think probably the one that we brought the allays back from a while ago. So maybe we should head over to that one and see if we can find any chests there that I haven't looted. In fact, I have a sneaking suspicion that we may not even have raided this entire bastion. A suspicion which has been confirmed by the fact that there are clearly a couple of piglin brutes walking up around there that have not been dealt with yet. So we're going to have to play this ever so slightly careful if we want to get out of this one alive. But this is a housing unit bastion. It's kind of obvious by the fact that there is a patch of nether wart and soul sand down there and directly next to that is a chest there should also be some chests dotted around the individual houses and there are certainly some chests up there on the ramparts as there often are with the other bastion types so i'm thinking the first stop is going to be up here on the ramparts and i'm going to try and lava bucket the piglin brutes from up above just so we don't have to worry about dealing with them let's knock out a couple of blocks here i can see a couple of those the trick is to get line of sight to them and let them notice me and then pour a lava bucket down there and hopefully some of that should flow in their general direction then with the lava cleared up we're going to hop on down here there don't seem to be any other piglins around so we can open this up and there we go immediately we've got a soul speed too plus a couple of other things that we can otherwise get from piglin bartering i'll grab all of the gilded blackstone the golden carrots all of that stuff the bone blocks and whatnot we don't necessarily need and a curse of vanishing pickaxe of course it had to be soul speed max is out at level three so we don't need to go any higher than soul speed three if we end up finding another soul speed two book we could combine them but for now at least we can guarantee that we can put the soul speed effect on the boots it's just about whether or not we want to max the effect out. And the purpose of the soul speed enchantment is to increase the speed at which you walk on soul sand or soul soil. You basically ignore the slowdown that normally happens on soul sand, and in fact, you end up getting a speed boost. With soul speed 2, you walk about 50% faster, and with soul speed 3, you walk about 60% faster. So it's not the biggest increase between the two, but if we can get this effect now, we might as well max it out, right? So let's take a quick look from the top down here and see if we can spot any chests. There are a couple of hoglins moseying around here, and I don't know if they've spawned with these structures. I'm fairly certain that's just a byproduct of this being in a crimson forest biome. But I'm going to see if I can scope out any other chests from here. The main one, of course, is down there, and I'm not certain if any piglin brutes will be able to path find to me in the center, but of course, I could use some of this blackstone brick here to pillar up if I needed to. So I think I'll take my chances. We're going to float on down here, and we're going to pillar up almost immediately to prevent any piglin brutes from... <laughs> rolling up on me like that guy just did. There's one over there who hasn't seemed to spot me yet. Oh no, there he is. He's coming for me at this moment. And there are two of them over there that don't seem to be able to pathfind over to me 
in the condition they currently are. So that should give me plenty of time to deal with this guy. And now the main issue is ignoring detection by the other piglins while I ransack this chest, which I should be able to do if I just throw a few blocks up around me like this. And looks like we didn't get a soul speed book in here, but we did get hold of an ancient debris, which I am happily going to take. And another block of gold, which means we can probably barter a few more times with the local piglins. In fact, why not? I think it's actually quite funny to be bartering with piglins in the middle of one of their own houses when there are piglin brutes on the ramparts wanting to kill us. We know that the odds are pretty low, it's basically a 1 in 100 chance of getting a soul speed book out of this lot, but mm, we can give it a try anyway. Oh, we got some ender pearls out of that one. <laughs> Three more ender pearls, that's an unlikely trade. And it looks like a fire charge was all we got from that one. Hey, not to worry, there's a bit of gravel over here as well, but that is all we're getting from these piglins. I think we'll deal with Soul Speed 2 for now, and if I really want to upgrade to Soul Speed 3 later, I can do a bit more intensive piglin bartering, and we can increase the enchantment from there. So for now, let's take the boots off, and let's see if we have enough levels. Of course we do, it only takes 11 levels, so that's promising if we need to upgrade Soul Speed 2 to Soul Speed 3 in future, but now at least we should be 50% faster running on Soul Sand and soul soil. Let's return to the nether and test this out. So by now, you're probably used to trudging your way through the soul sand valleys, probably hopping up and down to avoid the speed decrease that you get and moving as sluggishly as you do. It feels like you're walking at sneaking pace when you're walking through a soul sand valley, and most of us try to hop around a little bit or find patches of soul soil instead of soul sand, which do not lead to that speed decrease. However, put on the soul speed boots and suddenly you will find that you are moving a lot faster. It sort of feels like we have the swiftness effect applied to us, that speed effect that you get from a potion of swiftness, and it can make sprinting feel very fast indeed. We can definitely outpace skeletons when we're running at this kind of speed, although they will occasionally get a couple of shots off on us. You'll notice also that blue particles appear behind you as you're traveling with soul speed, and here is the downside of using this enchantment. It decreases the durability on your boots when you have the soul speed effect active. So as you run around on soul speed, you'll notice those soul particles escaping. But one of the things that is supposed to indicate is that there is energy coming off of your boots and that energy is depleting the durability. Now it's not having a huge effect here right now because I'm fighting these skeletons, which means my gear is mending itself as it goes. And we also have Unbreaking 3, which prevents any durability decrease to these boots about 75% of the time. So we're not going to find the effect nearly as striking on netherite boots, which already have the highest durability of any armor in the game, with Unbreaking 3 on top of that. In addition, checking the data on the Minecraft wiki, it seems like the durability of boots only has a 4% chance to go down with each block that you step on, so you're not going to wear out a set of gold soul speed boots within a matter of you know, 30 or 40 blocks. It's going to last a little bit longer than that. However, a 4% chance means that on average, you're probably decreasing a point of durability every 20 or so blocks that you travel, which is going to add up quite quickly if you're traveling over large areas of Soul Sand Valley. So from now on, we will have to be a little bit more careful about the durability on the boots, and that's one of the reasons why I've waited this long to add Soul Speed. However, I don't expect to find myself running around on Soul Sand all that often, and I gain XP frequently enough that it shouldn't be a hassle to repair these boots whenever we need to. Hopefully in future we'll be able to make ourselves even faster by trading a couple more soul speed books with these piglins for gold ingots, but for now we can be happy knowing that we've got that final enchantment for the boots all figured out. And who knows, maybe when we come to set up our nether hub we can install some soul sand walkways that will make it even faster to travel from location to location. We'll work on nether fast travel of other kinds in future episodes, but for now I think that's where we'll wrap up for this episode. Folks, thank you so much for watching this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you've enjoyed this look at piglin bartering, and it's a system we're going to be relying on a lot more in future. I'm off to work a little bit more on my villager trading hall, so for now, thanks for watching. My name has been Pixel Riffs. Don't forget to leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it, subscribe if you want to see more, and I'll see you folks soon. Take care, bye for now.